So hello and welcome to the video. Right, wish me luck. At the very start of this channel's history, I made a video about the British Airways Executive Club. I note changes that come along to that executive club, and every time I collect six things, I make an update video. It took about a year for BA to do six things prior to my last video back in August. But in the five months since, I've already collected seven or eight things, and some of them are quite significant and quite complicated and quite hard to explain in a video like this. But I've invested quite a number of hours in writing a script that will explain those changes in a way that I hope holds your attention. We'll only know at the end if I have succeeded. And I'll try and address the question that many people are asking, which is what is BA actually trying to achieve here? So if you'd like to see me explain six ways in which the British Executive Club has changed in a way that doesn't send everyone to sleep, then stick around. Hi, I'm Matt. I've lived in five countries on four continents. I've flown over 1.4 million miles. I've visited over 100 countries, every American state, but I'm nowhere near done. So subscribe and you might pick up some hacks, hints and tips to make your next trip better. I said I'd noticed seven or eight things and promised to explain six. Well, that's because a couple of them are really quite simple. The first is that BA has moved into Terminal 8 at JFK Airport to operate alongside its partner, American Airlines. I'm going through JFK in January, so I'm looking forward to visiting some of the lounges that have opened to accompany this development, and I'll report back to you on those then. And BA has returned to offering a full club dining experience on its flights. So expect the criticism to move from I don't like having my dinner all on one tray to how on earth could it have taken so long for them to have served a dinner. But to be fair, the bulk of the comments that I've seen online so far have been very positive about this change. So the first properly significant point is that BA has devalued avios in a specific circumstance, kind of. A few videos back I talked about how BA has established a floor valuation for its avios through the relationship it has with nectar points, and that valuation was 0.8 of a P. You could transfer avios by your shopping in Sainsbury's, and so that established a floor valuation for those avios. Which was quite significant. It meant that any utilisation of those avios that delivered a lower value than that was unquestionably a bad deal. But almost everything BA ever offers you is at a valuation that's less than that 0.8 of a P. So I always had the nagging suspicion that BA might not have fully thought things through. And indeed it seems like they hadn't thought things through as they have now changed that conversion rate. Now you'll get 0.67p per avio transferred to the Nectar scheme, which is a 17% devaluation. The conversion rate from Nectar to avio, so moving the other way, hasn't changed, which is probably a bit odd. So this is a devaluation, but it's a devaluation of the floor valuation of an avio, rather than a wholesale devaluation of the program. I would never transfer avios to Nectar at 0.8 of a P, because I believe you can get better value for that by using your avios for flights. Indeed, I eagerly collect Nectar points to convert them to avios, and that conversion rate has not changed. So the fact that this floor valuation rate has changed is significant, and it may have an impact on some people, but the big point of all of this is unchanged. You should always know the value you are receiving from an avio when you spend it. If you were able to do better than the 0.8 of a p that used to prevail, you will certainly be doing better than the 0.67 of a p that now prevails. On the theme of the value of an avio, here is point three, which is that British Airways has introduced a subscription program for buying avios. You've always been able to buy avios in blocks up to 200,000 a year although the rate they were charging for them was terrible. At best, you were paying 1.61p per avio, which is twice the rate you used to be able to redeem them for through Nectar. The purchase option was helpful if you needed a small amount to unlock a large redemption, but I would never be a buyer at those prices. They occasionally offered a bonus, a 50% bonus promotion just ended, but that brought the pricing down to 
just over 1p each. And in a couple of weeks I'll release a video which shows how I got almost 400,000 avios this year and I'll show you six ways that you can get more avios too and none of those ways involve buying avios from British Airways. So BA's new subscription program delivers these Avios via a monthly subscription. This represents about a 55% discount versus buying those Avios in the old blocks, which brings the cost down to as little as 0.89p per Avio. This is starting to get interesting as most people reckon you should be able to get at least 1p per Avio in value on flight redemptions. So it's something that is certainly worth considering, particularly as Qatar Airways has recently adopted Avios. So you can now get to and from Australia in business class for 180,000 Avios. So if you can find availability by booking well in advance, then getting a return flight from Europe to Australia in Qatar's Q suites using Avios bought from BA via this subscription program for under £1,800, that sounds good to me. Right, on to point four, which is where it all starts to get a little bit complicated. To understand what's happened and to understand the consequences, we have to go through a little bit of history, much of which I've covered before, so I'll try to be quick. When I were a lad, back before computers did everything, airfares used to be published in physical books, which needed to be typeset, they needed to be printed, and they needed to be distributed to travel agents. This took time and money, so prices were only changed a couple of times a year. Which created a real problem when fares needed to be changed quickly, such as was required when an oil price shock sent jet fuel prices rocketing. Airlines were losing a lot of money because they couldn't change their prices as quickly as their costs were increasing. Until somebody noticed that there already was a mechanism for changing prices quickly. Government taxes were outside of an airline's control, so were collected via a different system to the fares. So if an airline added their own tax to the taxes section of a fare, they could get a price change into the market very quickly. So the fuel surcharge was born. Of course, when jet fuel costs went back down, the surcharges didn't reduce. Airlines quite liked making more money, particularly as customers often didn't realise that the taxes they were paying contained a chunk that was going to the airline. Over time it became completely ridiculous to call these things fuel surcharges as they correlated in no way at all to the actual fuel price, so a combination of common sense and regulatory pressure resulted in them being renamed as carrier imposed surcharges. So we ended up in the very daft situation where airlines often make more money from their surcharges than they do from the fare. Here's an economy fare to New York. The fare itself is only £11.50 each way, but there's £100 of surcharges each way. So what? You may be screaming. Well, when you redeem points on an award fare, you are getting the fare for free, but you still have to pay the taxes and charges, including the airlines component. So a free ticket is not nearly as free as most people think. A redemption on this flight to New York would cost 13,000 avios, in return for which you are getting £11.50 in value, which is 0.09 of a P each. That's less than a tenth of the value you used to get from transferring avios across to Nectar, which is clearly outrageous. That was New York, but for years it was very similar on European redemptions. So over a decade ago, even BA recognised that this was all a bit ridiculous, and so they launched Reward Flight Savers. This reduced the cash you needed to pay for a redemption at the expense of needing more avios. It felt like they were giving you a huge discount on the taxes that were payable on a fare, but as a chunk of those taxes were already going to the airline, they were effectively just buying your avios back off you. It was difficult to see the rate that was being applied, but I would wager that it was less than 0.8p per avio. Right, history lesson over, except to say that RFS pricing only used to apply to European flights. BA started a trial on long-haul flights just before the pandemic, and it's fair to say that customers quite liked having this lower cash option. So point four is that British Airways has now rolled out reward flight saver pricing on all of its global routes in all classes except first class. 
which you'd think would be a good thing because people quite liked the reward flight saver option. Well, BA has effectively made this RFS pricing compulsory, whereas people used to like having the option. And as access to RFS pricing is actually limited, there are a very large number of people who are quite furious. So first of all, you can only get access to RFS pricing if your membership account is based in the UK or the United States, and you have earned at least one Avio in the last 12 months. I believe access to RFS pricing was only extended to US-based members as part of this rollout. So before this change, a return in business class from London to New York cost 100,000 Avios off-peak plus 853 in taxes and fees. Now, with RFS pricing in force, the headline option is 160,000 Avios plus just £350. So you're paying 60,000 Avios to reduce the cash payment by £503, which means you're getting 0.84 of a P per Avio, which is OK, not brilliant, but it's also not terrible. But here's the problem. If you can't access the RFS fares, the base redemption price has now been increased to that 160,000 avios with the 853 pounds of taxes still applying. I can't show you this because I can only see RFS pricing via my login, but there are reports that this is a massive devaluation for many, many people, between 60 and 90% on most routes. It's possible that BA didn't anticipate this, or that their atrocious IT failed to deliver the change in the way that was expected. So they may change the non-RFS pricing back when they work it out. But if they did anticipate this, and this indeed was what they intended, it is a massive kick in the teeth for a lot of their loyal members. It does not unlock more value and reward for its members as their press release asserts. So you're furious if you can't access RFS pricing. But what is the impact if you can access RFS pricing? Well, there are winners and there are losers, but in many ways it's actually quite neutral. Returning to that New York flight and looking at the other pricing options, the 100,000 Avios option is still there. Indeed, the taxes are three pounds cheaper. So for New York redemptions, the bottom line is that you now have the option to trade in some Avios at a decent but not fantastic valuation. If you don't want to do that, or you don't have enough avios to do that, then you're not really any worse off, although there are some losers. That non-RFS pricing has not been maintained for all destinations. I'm leaning on Head for Points reporting here because I don't have all the historic data, but Rob and his team have found that there has been a devaluation on the Barbados route. The old base fare option is no longer an option, and it will cost you £120 more for a redemption. I'm sure people will ferret out more destinations which have got more expensive, and I doubt they'll find any that have got cheaper. So the Barbados route has experienced a devaluation, and it is a very popular route, which makes this feel like it was a deliberate act. You are a winner, though, if you have a two-for-one voucher to redeem. The old and new Amex vouchers are treated slightly differently to make this even more complicated, but I'm only going to talk about the new style vouchers. I'll include a link to a Head for Points article which explains what's happening to the old two for vouchers. So with a two for redemption, you get the fare for free and you have to pay the taxes. So if the fare has gone up and the taxes have gone down, you ought to be getting better value for your redemption. A redemption to New York used to be 100,000 avios plus two times the old taxes, which is 1,706. It's now 160,000 avios plus two times the new taxes, which is 700 pounds. So the extra 60,000 avios you're spending is saving you £1,006, which is 1.68p per avio, which is fantastic. Happy days, provided, of course, you have the 60,000 avios extra that you need to spend. As Rob at Head for Points emphasises, getting 100,000 avios for a two for redemption is hard enough. Getting 160,000 may be out of range for a lot of people. If you don't have the 60,000 avios, you could, of course, buy them through that new subscription service. You'd be paying less than a P for one, and you'd be getting 1.6, 1.7p in value for it. Or you could just make your redemption at the old rates and be no worse off. 
That's not the case with Barbados though, where that change in the base pricing does carry through to a TUFA reduction, meaning it will cost you about £120 more than it used to. There are plenty of other consequences and people are finding more every day. For example, Head for Points has worked out that it is now cheaper to redeem both ways in first class rather to go one way in club and the other in first, which is ridiculous and I can't believe that is what BA intended. It used to make no sense to buy two one-way redemptions for a flight to the United States because the surcharges BA added to flights from the United States were exorbitant. But pricing has now been equalised both ways across the Atlantic, so buying two one-ways is now a viable option. Conversely, the old wheeze of getting two one-way redemptions for trips to Brazil or to Hong Kong is no longer an option. Local laws forbid the type of carrier surcharge all of this is based upon, but that opportunity has now been shut down as, again, pricing has been equalised in both directions. Whether BA anticipated all of these consequences is unclear, and I think it's unlikely. With the nectar conversion rate, they realised they got it wrong and changed it. And there's another example coming up of where an announcement was made and later had to be changed. So it is possible that they will tweak things when all of the consequences become clear. But if everything I've described is intended, it's a really nasty development. But for me, as a UK-based member with access to RFS pricing, on balance it's probably positive, even if it stinks for others. Two more updates, but they're quick. Number five is that Iberia has changed the basis of earning avios when flying. This is significant because Iberia is BA's sister airline, and in the course of announcing this Iberia change, they let slip that BA is going to do the same at some point in 2023. BA, and Iberia before they changed, rewarded you with avios based on the distance flown and the cabin flown in. So if you travelled on a super cheap XEU business class fare, you could accrue a clump of avios at a very low cost. Iberia will now give avios based on the price paid with a status tier multiplier. This is likely to benefit travellers with status who travel on full fare tickets, but it will penalise cheap Charlies like me who travel on discounted XEU fares. Which will be a right pain if, indeed, BA follows through on this change. But Iberia has already had to back away from some of its strategy as unintended consequences of this change became clear and the airline recognised it was making itself uncompetitive. That's another example of an IAG airline making an announcement, realising they got it wrong, and then having to change it. Little bit of speculation here, but as we've seen, the fare element that you pay, which is the part on which avios will be granted, is usually a small element of the total price paid because of the whack of surcharges that go into taxes and fees. But after implementing RFS pricing around Europe, BA actually removed or significantly reduced its surcharges, preferring to put that revenue back in as its top line fare. With RFS style pricing in force all around Europe, there was no longer any need to hide some of its revenue in the taxes. If they do the same on their international routes, now this RFS pricing is global, the Avio's earning portion that you pay may end up being quite a lot higher than it may have been in the past. That's a very dull paragraph for which I apologise, but I'm speculating here that this RFS rollout may be an essential step for BA on the road to changing the basis on which avios are earned whilst flying, and it might not be quite as terrible as it first sounded. It's a wider topic, but revenue-based loyalty programmes are the direction in which the industry is moving, and most schemes in the United States already follow this model. The days of harvesting tens of thousands of avios from a £1,000 XEU fare may be numbered. But only earning a few hundred avios from those trips would be a real blow. And the final change is unquestionably a good and finish on a high. Two for one Amex vouchers can now be used on Iberia and on Aer Lingus. And I've tested it and that functionality is fully integrated into the BA systems. 
That's great for those living in the north because Aer Lingus flies from Manchester to Orlando, Barbados and New York, all of which are now eligible for a two-for-one redemption. And Iberia flies to lots of interesting places in Central and South America that British Airways goes nowhere near. So although having to get to Madrid to start a trip is a bit of a pain, it really does open up some interesting options. Iberia's Avios pricing and taxes are quite attractive too. So I asked the question, what is BA doing here? Well, they're a business that's trying to make money. They seem to have done a string of things which is designed to improve their profitability. They've acted to reduce the value we get for our Avios in some circumstances, either by devaluing them or by closing down loopholes that we used to take advantage of to get good value. They obviously believe that any business they lose from these changes is business they didn't want anyway because it wasn't profitable. They may be right, but I think a lot of what they've done is a mistake and a lot of other commentators agree with me. Fundamentally, we're talking about a loyalty program here and what BA is doing reduces trust in them, which I believe will reduce people's loyalty. So we can vote with our feet and we can move our business elsewhere, which is much easier to do these days given that Avios is the currency that's used by Qatar, Iberia and Aer Lingus. Or we can acknowledge that whilst the PR about loyalty programs leads us to believe that they are run for our benefit, they are in fact profit vehicles for the airline. And if we find a way of extracting what we perceive to be value from that program, the airline will probably spot it and will eventually close it down. So I'll restate my usual advice, which is to avoid carrying a large balance in any loyalty program, as all of them will inevitably move away from you in the medium to long term, and you don't want to be stuck with value that is declining over time. Having a realistic, by which I mean pessimistic, view of how loyalty programs are run is the right thing for everyone to do. But for me, personally, the two most significant things from this entire video are firstly the opening up of two for redemptions to Iberia and Aer Lingus, which is something I am already actively looking to take advantage of and the potential reduction in avios earned when travelling, which will really suck. There may still be unintended consequences discovered from the RFS pricing change, but having studied it in reasonable detail, I'm really not that bothered myself. So thanks for watching this video and thanks for sticking around to the end. Quite a tricky one to script as you can imagine and I'll only find out when I've edited it whether I've succeeded in communicating these principles to you. Please let me know in the comments what you think. Please give this video a like too. It is the least you can do. And if you're new, please consider subscribing because this sort of stuff is what the channel is founded upon. And if you really liked what I'm doing here, you can support me very directly and a link to a Patreon account will be found in the description below. Thanks again for your patience. Thanks for watching and I'll see you all in the next one. Goodbye.